Tucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I wanted to welcome you to the 24th in the forum's webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled, All You Need to Know About the CBRS Certified Professional Installer Process. A few introductory slides before we get started. First, um, we're going to post the slides that are being presented during this webinar. They'll be available at wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars. Um, and uh, they will be available after this webinar completes. I believe we're also going to post them in the handouts section uh, towards the end of the end of the session. We're recording today's webinar and it'll be on the forum's YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube and search Wireless Innovation Forum and you can find our YouTube channel and all of the webinars are there. And if you need more information about the webinars or, or anything else associated with the Wireless Innovation Forum, feel free to send me an email at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. Participation today, um, I'm assuming if you're hearing me that you've already joined by uh, uh, joined and have the audio connection. Uh, if your uh, speakers aren't working well, there's a dial in available as well. If you just click the little telephone button, you can uh, dial in and hear it from there. There's a questions panel uh, on your screen. We'll be taking questions throughout and then there's a dedicated question session at the end of the webinar. So if you type your questions into there, um, I'll, I'll be reviewing them and providing them to the panelists so that they can they can answer them as we go. So with that as background, I'll uh, go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Uh, our speaker today, our moderator today for the panel is Richard Bernhardt. Richard is the National Spectrum Advisor for the Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, or WISPA. And he's also the chair of our Spectrum Sharing Committee Work Group 5, which is the CBRS Operations Work Group. So, Richard, welcome. Welcome, and thank you very much, Lee. Appreciate the introduction. And uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today, guys. So, I'm going to tell you the format, tell you a little bit about what we're going to do, a little bit about the history of this. Um, I'm going to give you some background on CPI and on the training programs that are available, a little bit about where we are with CBRS. And then I have a very esteemed uh, panel of training program providers or training program administrators um, that will uh, speak for about 20 minutes on a roundtable panel. Um, I'll introduce them now and then I'll introduce them a little bit later. We'll have uh, Federated Wireless, Masood Olfat will be representing Federated. Um, with us is uh, for Nokia is Nancy Lee and for Google, Beatrice Sebastian and for Comscope, uh, Laura Fontaine. So all four of the current uh, TPAs will be represented in a panel discussion and they all have their programs up and going and so they're going to discuss how you can uh, work with them, what the programs are like, what the differences are, and answer some questions regarding um, the TPA programs that will train CPIs. And then we'll have an open question and answer session for a short period after the, um, after the panel. If you'd like to ask questions during the webinar, there is a chat window that you can uh, type your questions in. Uh, Lee Pucker is uh, moderating the chat, and if he feels a question fits in with the flow and it makes sense, he'll um, let me know, and we'll ask, a, we'll answer that question to the best of our ability. One quick disclaimer: um, there's a lot of information in this webinar, and you'll have an opportunity to see it on the slides and, and in the recording. Um, we're not giving you legal advice or business advice. If you have to make a dependency issue on any of these matters. Uh, that has anything to do with your business, um, I would suggest you get appropriate counsel. So that's the quick disclaimer for the morning. So let's uh, let's begin. Uh, my name is Richard Bernhardt, as uh, as Lee said. I am the National Spectrum Advisor for the uh, Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, and I work with WinForum very closely on the specifications, especially the ones that deal with uh, CPI and, and TPA and a lot of other matters with regards to the standards and specifications for CBRS. My contact information is available on this slide and uh, included will be uh, shown again at the end of this presentation. Uh, I invite you to have questions or comments or things that you'd like to know beyond the scope of this webinar or the scope of this webinar to get a hold of me. 
So let's move into the subject matter because what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about why and what a CPI does and why you need one. Uh, we're going to get into how they operate, how they get trained, when you need to use one on a category A or a category B. We'll talk a little bit about the law and the regulations, part 96. Uh, we'll talk about the specifications and a whole lot more. So what is a CPI? What is a certified professional installer and why the heck do you need one? You know, CPIs are responsible for assuring that the registration data entered into the Spectrum Access System for certain types of CBRS devices is accurate and that the device is valid to be registered and to request a grant. That was how we initiated the CPI system when the specification launched in January of 2018 and it remains the main and central reason for doing um, CPI today. A little bit of historical perspective on why CPI, uh, CPI in the CBRS ecosystem. The way in which CPI is approached in the CBRS ecosystem is much uh, different than it has ever been approached before, but it isn't the first time that the idea of a professionally installed device has been approached by the FCC. Um, the FCC has contemplated CPI or at least professionally ins uh, installed uh, requirements in some of the licensed bands where it required that very specific information be relayed back either to the FCC or other uh, operators in the band. Um, and it was more uh, directly approached in the early version of TV white space. Um, in TV white space, there was a central database that was used to operate and coordinate the um, use of spectrum, and it was required that the devices be professionally installed. The FCC uses this term professionally installed to encompass a lot of different things. In TV white space, um, it was tried, and it still is in place that a professional installer has to do the work. But a number of geographic errors were noted, and there were you had the capability of doing things like register in San Francisco and operate in New York. So uh, it was felt that the system that was being used with TV white space uh, would not be adequate for CBRS, as we'll see in a few slides. Um, there are incumbents in the CBRS system that are very uh, serious incumbents, and uh, interference with those incumbents causes major problems. So there's a need for additional verification and validation by those incumbents, including the federal incumbents. And the, the system that is uh, created for CBRS creates a balance between the SAS operators or the SAS administrators, um, the operators, the CPI's job themselves, and certificates of authority. They are, in fact, a central point of reference. Next slide, Lee. So um, is the CPI, the certified, what is the CPI in the first place and, and are they actually the physical installer of the CBSD? So let me define first what a CBSD is. I'll get into a great deal of detail about that in a few minutes. But the CBSD is the radio devices that are registered with the SAS that operate in the CBS, uh, CBRS ecosystem. They are the devices which need to be installed and which will communicate with the SAS. So a CPI or a certified professional installer is, uh, is designated under Part 96 and WinForum specifications as the party responsible for entering accurate data to the SAS for registration and grant requests. The CPI can be a physical installer. In other words, your present installer or installers that you use in the field can be trained to become CPIs, but that is not a role that is absolutely required by Part 96 or Wind Forum specifications. What that means is, is the person who turns the screws doesn't necessarily have to be the person who is the CPI. The CPI must fulfill roles, but the full CBSD installation may require additional skills and functions that are beyond a CPI's requirements. So if a CPI does not necessarily have to be the one who climbs poles or focuses um, antennas or understands all of RF. They have a certain and functional role to register a device with certain specific information. That can be combined with a physical installer, but it doesn't have to be. So the CPI may work with a physical installer, or they may be the same person. That's sort of up to you if you're an operator. And the CPIs are responsible primarily for the accuracy and verification of the data put in. Next slide. So when do you need to use a CPI? 
here's a working guide on when you have to use a CPI. So there are different categories of, of CBSDs or radios that operate on the CBRS spectrum. Um, they're typically broken down into three different areas. The top area, the most uh, powerful, is called category B. It's for devices that operate between uh, 30 decibels or dBm per 10 megahertz up to 47 dBm per 10 megahertz, and that's the ceiling. And it's using EIRP in the combination and including the combination of the antenna and the radio itself. So the total EIRP cannot exceed those numbers and must be within that range. All category B devices require a CPI to install them. C uh, CBSD category B devices are sometimes known as base stations or CPE, client to high power client devices, E node Bs, subscriber units, AP units, uh, different uses call them different things. But in CBRS, it's devices which are operating within the rules of part 96 and which are gonna operate on uh, in the ecosystem between 30 and 47 dBm per 10 megahertz. The lower power category of CBSDs is known as category A. Category A is between 23 dBm and 30 dBm per 10 megahertz. In most cases, this will require a CPI, but there are some exceptions. Um, if, if your device is indoors and it's lower than six meters in height above average terrain um, and able to geolocate, then it is capable of being installed without a CPI. As of today, there are very few devices that can meet this requirement indoor um, because GPS is not, not, does not very accurately deal with altitude. And when GPS is inside a building considerably and depending upon the type of building materials that are being used, it also doesn't register accurately. So you have to assume that most indoor uh, devices at this point will also require a CPI. If a CPI is taken outdoors, and it, it uh, goes above those requirements, then it'll be considered a category B, and we'll discuss that in a minute. The third category of device that you find on the ecosystem is called an end user device. This might be a cell phone or a low power device or a low power CPE that is a non-serving device. It's a device that doesn't um, act as a, a, survey, a server to another um, CBSD. It is the interactive device um, with a CBSD. It, it must be uh, 23 dBm or lower per 10 megahertz, and it is designated as an EUD. So it's a category that does not require CPI installation. Next slide, please. So why uh, CPIs, what do they do and why do we need them? First and foremost, the obligation of the CPI is to enter registration information which is conveyed to the Spectrum Access System or the SAS to provide accurate information about all kinds of different things that that radio will do. Its location, its, its uh, antenna characteristics, its serial number, we'll go into the details of that in a slide or two, but um, the first role of a CPI is to convey uniform and accurate information. It provides a uniformity in the ecosystem by ensuring that the installs of the CBRS ecosystem are consistent. The SAS depends upon the correct CPI data to protect incumbents, understand available spectrum guidance, and provide guidance on interference and other things. CPIs are accountable, and this is a big theme that uh, that makes the CPI system uh, reliable. CPIs go through a set of training, which we're gonna to talk to the training uh, administrators in a few minutes, um, and they go through a certification and they work with, uh, as you'll see, Certificate of Authority PKI providers, um, but they're independent and accountable for the work that they do. So the SAS must depend upon the accuracy and completeness of their data. It becomes their responsibility. Tied with the CPI is the use of certificates of authority. A certificate of authority is a, is a confirmation mechanism, an electronic confirmation mechanism that's done uh, a number of different ways, but it, it couples by keys the, the use of the uh, CPI, their identity with the SAS, so the SAS can verify that is the actual person that they're talking to and that they have the right to communicate with the SAS. They act in, in, in clearly in a method of verification and validation, and that must be kept current. 
And CPIs keep up to date. They pay attention to what Part 96 is about, if there are changes in the rules, if there are changes in the wind forum specifications or other requirements, both mandatory and non-mandatory, they are a, a central source of information to make sure that radios are installed correctly. Next slide, please. So uh, why are they required? So um, if you look at 47 USC part 96, which is the guiding rules for um, CBRS, and the link is there, and if you just look up on any Google search for CBRS rules, you will find um, a, a list of all the rules for the devices and for the administrators and, and everything else dealing with part 96, usually the ECFR is a good one to go with. Um, you will find, in in some of the sections are where the requirement comes from. Um, so if you look at 9645, it gives the basis initially for category B devices to be professionally installed. Now you note it doesn't say CPI there, it just says professionally installed. And we're gonna get into the, the reasoning behind why WinForum developed the CPI system. But the mandate of the FCC is that all category B devices be professionally installed. And I'll leave you to read the rest of the, the regulation another time, but basically it says that uh, a category B device, which is operating between 3550 and 3650 um, band or 3700 band, um, must be authorized consistent with um, the operation of the ecosystem and must be professionally installed. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned category B before, here's the rules for category A. This is um, part uh, 96, section 96.43. A category B, a category A CBSD shall not be deployed or operated outdoors with an antenna exceeding six meters height above average terrain. Height above average terrain is a technical term for which the CPI is required to be able to calculate. It is not just taking an elevation. Um, and it requires some understanding of terrain and where things are located in order to put that information in accurately. If you're operating outdoors um, and exceed that HAT requirement, then the device itself is effectively treated as if it were a category B device. Um, and that means that even though it's a lower power device, it does require a CPI in order to install it. Um, you'll see that any CBSD which is operated at a higher power than specified in category A is also considered a category B device and requires CPI. So the, the areas where CPI would not be required would be all indoors um, and uh, would be under, a, under the category A power and must self-geolocate. Um, EUDs don't require CPIs to install them, but they are not considered CBSDs. Next slide, please. So uh, why do we require CPIs? So one of the things is, is to get to accuracy. And I've mentioned accuracy a couple of times. If you look at section 96.39 of, of part 96, it goes into very detailed specificity on what the accuracy must be. So when installing a device, the accuracy of a, of a CBSD has to be within plus or minus uh, 50 meters horizontal and plus or minus three meters of elevation. That three meters of elevation is really the one that kicks um, the, the accuracy down in C, on category A devices indoors. And so most devices at this point will require a CPI in order to get the coordinates in correctly. For professionally installed CBSDs, geographic coordinates to the same accuracy specified in the paragraph of this section may be determined and reported to the SAS as part of the installation and the registration process. They have to be determined and reported each time the CBSD is moved to a new location. So let me clearly state that too. The role of the CPI is to install the CBSD. If the CBSD is to be moved to another location, then the CBSD itself must be registered or corrected by the CPI so that the location is known to the SAS. CBSDs are fixed devices in the ecosystem. While an EUD may move around, CBSDs category A and category B are fixed devices and their location has to be accurate. Next slide, please.
So I mentioned at the top that there were other places that CPI or at least professionally installed uh, requirement by the FCC is in place. Um, the two that I mentioned are TV white space and license spectrum. But why is CBRS requiring a different requirement than what TV white space or the license spectrum had? So in CBRS, there are incumbents that are operating in a different fashion than they were in TV white space or in any of the license spectrum. Um, the incumbents in CBRS CPI, for CPI include federal and governmental uses, FSS satellites, and grandfathered wireless devices. So the accuracy of the installation matters so as not to cause the SAS to get erroneous information which could have could affect how they protect those incumbents. If they don't, if they're not able to accurately protect those incumbents, you're going to have an effect on a on a federal radar system or on a satellite fixed satellite system, um, or on grandfathered wireless. Um, the use of CPI in CBRS also ensures a uniform deployment of CBRS and CBSDs. CBSDs. That uniform deployment allows for better coexistence in the band because you're able to know uh, where things are relative to others, the types of uses that are being used. And remember, CBRS is a diverse use, diverse technology. It's a, doesn't require a specific technology in CBRS. So you may have different technologies uh, and different uses in the same space. So the accurate information provided in registration is critical um, to the SAS. And the SAS uses it for a diversity of technologies as I just mentioned. Next slide. So um, WinForum, developed a series of standards um, and these these standards set forth all of the operating parameters for CBRS and you can see a, a, an illustration of these standards um, in the ecosystem the 10 basic standards for um, CBRS here and you can note that part of those standards is the use of approved CPI training programs and CPI um, it, it it's sort of like a big gear. If you don't have all the tines to the gear, the gear doesn't operate properly. So certified professional installers, you can see them in the red area, you can see them in the blue area, giving you um, both a um, integrated set of, of rules that um, that are verifiable and validated and, in, and with accurate information. And the result is um, certified output. So um, all kinds of things which verify that the information is clean and secure. Next slide. So WinForum um, is an organization that works with stakeholders and work to create the initial set of specifications. So in this case, it is serving as the uh, training program administrator accrediting body. That's one of its roles. And the second role is, is that it operates the CPI database. So let's talk about each of those things and what they mean. Um, the early last year or uh, I don't know exactly when we did this. We we put out an uh, an RFP or a request for proposal for training program groups to come in and say they wanted to be an organization that was certified with um, with WinForum to be able to train CPIs consistent with Part 96 and consistent with WinForum specifications on CPI. Um, so that the CPI that came out would be able to work in the ecosystem, stay current, and work within the validation requirements. So WinForum is the accrediting body for the training program administrators. They're not the trainers. WinForum doesn't train. You're going to meet the trainers in just a few minutes. Um, and the accrediting body also maintains a database of all of the valid uh, CPI, all that went through training, get certified, and get their CA um, their certificates of authority uh, connected to them. They're registered in a database so that the SAS can validate that they're uh, current and that they have the ability to um, operate. Um, the WinForum approves TPAs and oversees the CPI process, but the TPAs actually have the relationship with the CPI. WinForum maintains the database, as I said, for CPIs that are entered into uh, that the TPAs enter the information into and are visible to the SAS. If you want to see the WinForum specification on CPIs, you can go to WinForum's TS or technical specification 
um, at 0247. It's very easy to find on the website. You can just click on it and it'll give you all of the specification requirements that WinForum has in its standards. And both the accrediting body um, and the TPA must, and CPIs must follow part 96 as put it set out by the FCC for the ecosystem. Next slide. So who are our training program administrators? And you have, I have to give all of these uh, administrators a lot of credit. They work very hard uh, to put together a very directed program um, for WinForum and for uh, the ecosystem. Uh, some of them as much as a year to get a good program together for you. So as of, uh, as of yesterday, we have four. Um, they are Comscope, Federated, Google, and Nokia. Um, there are one or two others in the pipeline that will be announced and uh, we'll announce them through WinForum as they come. There is a link there that you can go to um, to find out who, you know, the information about each of these uh, TPAs and how you can train uh, your people for uh, CPI. Um, and uh, you are invited to compare the programs. We're gonna discuss in the panel what's the difference between the programs, how you access them, um, what you can use them for, how long it takes, something about the exam and whatever else the TPAs wanna talk about. Next slide, please. So let's talk briefly about what a TPA does. So a TPA or Training Program Administrator Program, those four companies that I mentioned a moment ago, they train CPI, tra they train CPI trainers within their group um, and those trainers train the CPIs. They follow a strict curriculum that was provided by uh, WinForum and is based upon the WinForum specifications and on part 96. And a CPI must take a, a, a pre-put together CPI exam. That exam um, allows them to become certified and have them pass by a certain percentage in order to become competent and validated by the system to be a CPI. The TPA keeps the CPIs current with WinForum and FCC changes which go into effect. So as a, um, an, a specification or a rule changes, they contact and stay in touch with the CPI and make sure that they're educated on that subject. If the, if the CPI doesn't respond or doesn't understand it, they can be suspended until such time as they do understand it. The object is to make sure that they're current all the time when they're doing their job. Um, the TPA has a working relationship with uh, Certificate of Authority PKA, PKI sorry, uh, providers um, and they work with them to make sure that CPIs have verification and validation keys so that they can be verified to the SAS each and every time that they make contact with the SAS about registering um, CBSD devices. Um, the TPA is responsible for putting current data into the CPI database, the database that I mentioned earlier that's run by WinForum. SASs can then verify the CPI certification status at any given time, and the TPA can suspend the activation of a status by of a CPI in that database should there be a reason, either as a result of uh, not staying current the expiry of their, um, of their certification if they don't renew, and uh, if there's other discipline matters for which um, would cause that suspension. And finally, the TPA is responsible for maintaining current records um, to when, when their um, uh, applicants go through the initial testing and training, um, whether they've kept updated, whether there's been inquiries into them, and what's gone on with the database. So if there are, uh, if there's something that needs to be renewed or discipline or more, that is the TPA's responsibility. Next slide, please. Uh, Richard, quick question. Yep. Yes, sir. So um, the TPAs that you showed on the previous slide are all also running SASs. And a question came in, does it make sense to use the same TPA as the SAS that somebody's planning to use? Yeah, so it, it so happens that they are, um, with the exception at the moment of Nokia, who is in wave two, um, the, but the relationship as a SAS may give them experience, but no, it is not required that you go with the SAS, um, with the company that is your SAS. Um, there may be some benefits for doing that, and the TPAs may want to talk about their relationship between the two programs, but no, absolutely not. Uh, you can train with anybody, and your certification will be as valid um, uh, no matter which SAS you use or if you change use of, of SASs. Okay, thank you. Sure. Let's go on to the next slide. 
Um, so we mentioned what the CPI, what the TPAs do. Um, what does it take to become a CBRS CPI? Um, how do the training program administrators uh, feed you through a program in order to do that? Well, first you have to register with an approved, that's one of those four companies or another company if it's announced later, TPA administrators um, pay any applicable fees and costs and uh, take the course, make sure that it's you taking the course, we do verify that, and uh, then you take an exam and the exam is provided uh, by questions through WinForum to the uh, TPAs. They're consistent among the TPAs. So if you go to one TPA or another, you're not gonna get a, either a favorable or different set of questions. You might get a different set of questions because we use a pool, but um, they'll be the same weight on each of those questions. And you have to pass, the passing right now is 75%. Uh, in order to get your credentials. Um, the TPA will work with you to obtain a certificate of authority, public and private key credentials. You have to hold and keep and use those. Uh, you need to learn the technologies that you're gonna be operating with. Um, that may include different kinds of technologies, different products, different interfaces, and different SASs. Each SAS may have their own, um, their own uh, registration data, and you have to stay current. Next slide. So the, the certification itself is good for five years. Um, the CA um, coverage is also good for five years. There are some CAs that do them for less, but I believe most of the people are using the five years so that it goes in line with the, uh, the class that's being offered. The CPI credentials, and this is important, are held by the CPI, not the employer. So if you are a person looking or seeking to um, hire CPI, the CPI is like an independent contractor. They have their own credentials. The CPI credentials uh, can be suspended for failure to stay current, discipline, expiry, or not staying current on the current changes. CPIs are not necessarily the physical, as we mentioned earlier, the physical equipment installers, uh, despite the name. The name is sort of in, unfortunate. They use the name certified professional installer, but it doesn't have to be the actual physical installer. And the CPI should be able to do their work for any CBSD operator with any SAS within the ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on cost, but the TPAs will, will um, talk about that, but um, there is cost. Um, there are things that as, a, as someone training a CPI, you may um, have things that might affect the price, might be things like insurance, the cost of the exam, the training, keep, upkeep. Um, there, there are things which um, have costs. Um, the best thing to do is ask your CPI and they can tell you what the costs will be to use them. Next slide, please. All right, what does the CPI have to do to, uh, to get information to the SAS? They, and there's more than this, but these are some of the things that they have to do accurately. They have to give location information of the CBSD, its latitude, its longitude, its altitude or, or height. Um, it has to provide antenna information like down tilt and azimuth and beam width and gain. It has to provide power information and identifying information of the CPI itself, its CPI ID and, and uh, CA credentials, and device information, information about the CBSD, including things like serial number and other uh, characteristics of the device. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so right now the, there um, are certain things that a CPI must do. Um, and they must inf enter information accurately according to the registration, the mandatory registration requirements, but there might be things in the future that a CPI might do that go beyond that. So something that is specific to a particular technology or a particular product, these are non-mandatory or other data that's requested by the SAS that goes beyond the scope of registration. These are things that CPIs might do for you. Um, they might, uh, update, uh, this is really something that they're required to do, they might update or correct erroneous data that was entered or pre-entered into a device in either the single or multiple step uh, methodologies. Uh, they provide data for PAL protection areas. Uh, that's something that they might do in the future when PALs become uh, part of the system. Um, and they might assist when PALs become part of the system with the secondary market. These are things which may come in the future and they can cooperate with the owner of the CBSD device or with the SAS on other information um, that might be necessary for grouping or other things that will be useful for the efficiency of the, of the ecosystem. 
Next slide. Um, so how are TPAs, CPIs, and CAs related? TPAs maintain and train CPIs um, uh, and keep them going for the period of five years while they're uh, licensed. TPAs offer the CA connection, the Certificate of Authority connection. CPIs report the data that's necessary for the SASs to do their job. TPAs and CAs are both approved by WinForum. WinForum, is, however, is not related specifically to the individual CPIs. They are the accrediting body for the TPAs, and the TPAs have their relationship with the CPIs. And TPAs, CPIs, and CAs must follow Part 96 in WinForum specifications. Next slide, please. Uh, Richard, quick question. Yes. Yeah. If, if a CPI leaves Company A and joins Company B, does their certification automatically follow them over, or do they need to let WinForum or someone know of their move? Excellent question. The certification, as I said before, belongs to the CPI. So wherever they go with employ their employment, they are allowed to move uh, freely between uh, employers or they can act as independent contractors themselves. They will have a fixed CPI ID, a CPI RID, which is their identification of who they are and their CA. Um, uh, which is their keys to identify to the SAS. But if they move from one employer to another, they're fine. There's no issue with that. Next, let's move on to the next slide. So the mandatory requirements of a CPI are to meet the 0247 specifications of WinForum and the requirements of 112. Those are both WinForum specifications. The FCC rules, which include USC uh, 47 USC Part 96 and applicable clarifications or KDBs, which may come along the way and rule changes, and their requirements of the SAS for registration. As I said, though, there may be optional things that are asked of by the CPI, such as industry or technology-specific information, SAS-specific interfaces or requirements, grouping information uh, as requested by an operator, or other non-registration required data. And these are between the CPI and the SAS, or the CPI and the operator, and uh, can be sort of negotiated to provide additional information where necessary. And TPAs have the option to train optional information, such as anything from RF 101 to SAS-specific interfaces. Next slide, please. So um, where can a CPI work? Anywhere within the 50 states and territories that are covered by CBRS. Do CPIs install um, and register PAL equipment? Uh, well, there's no such thing as a PAL piece of equipment, but there is, um, in fact, devices that will operate in PAL. There is really no difference from the CPI's perspective between a GAA and a PAL device itself, but there may be some PAL identifying information which they'll provide in the future. Should a CPI understand how to get information that's required for registration? Yeah, that's the most critical thing for their job is to understand how to accurately enter that information and they must learn the methodology and a lot of, in fact, all of our TPAs provide information on practical approaches to registration parameters. Next slide. Um, and I'm actually going to skip over this. This just gives a little bit more information on the uh, the use of CPIs. I want to get to our panel, so let's let's skip over this slide. So one thing was I get asked this question quite often. Why shouldn't we just eliminate CPIs because it would be cheaper and easier not to have CPIs in the system? I started off this discussion by indicating the importance of protecting the incumbents and the government and commercial incumbents uh, need to have accurate information provided so interference doesn't take place. That is a critical reason why CPIs exist. Uniformity in the system is absolutely critical. And we do expect that there may be some automation in the future, which may change the role of a CPI, the critical nature of a CPI is still there. Next slide, please. When can I start getting my CPIs trained? The answer is right now and with the group of people we're about to talk to. Uh, deployment for ICD will be, uh, deployments will begin as soon as ICD begins, which should be fairly soon, uh, next couple of months, based upon FCC certification and public notice. Next slide.
All right, let's get to our panel. Here's some of the questions. Leave this slide up. So let me once again introduce our panel. Our panel is made up of the four companies that are our TPAs uh, in no particular order. I just have them written down this way. So uh, Federated Wireless is Masood Olfat is here uh, today. And with Nokia, we have Nancy Lee. And with Google, Beatrice Sebastian. And Comscope, Laura Fontaine. So uh, let's start off, and each of you will start off with better. We'll just go through the order here. Tell us a little bit about your program and why it's exciting to do training with your particular company. Why don't we start off with you, Masood? Uh, hey, Richard, thank you very much. Uh, magnificent presentation, very extensive, and thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity that you have given to Federated Wireless. Uh, Federated Wireless uh, is both a SaaS administrator as well as a TPA and uh, we can say that uh, uh, our program uh, has uh, basically been launched on May 1st, 2019. That was basically the first uh, online CPI program to be launched. Um, and uh, we are uh, the, we were the first web-based CPI program that were accredited by the Win Forum as well. Uh, the way to uh, have access to our uh, CPI training program, uh, there is a website that can be uh, used is cpi.federatedwireless.com. Federated Wireless is one word. That's how you can um, access to our program. It's a web-based program and. Uh, it takes uh, uh, approximately, in average, about six hours. And uh, basically, the students, the people who are uh, applicants, can take it in their own pace. Uh, it, is, it is not mandated to go uh, to in, a, in a certain time. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in addition to being a TPA, we are also a SAS administrator. And our plan is to uh, follow the CPI all through. In other words, uh, uh, our, our uh, engineers, uh, even after the training is done, especially for the CPIs that are working with our SAS, admin, with our, SAS uh, our uh, engineers uh, keep uh, working with them to help them to uh, being able to communicate with our SAS and uh, register CBSs in our SAS. So I'll uh, I'll stop here and then leave the rest if uh, for other questions. Great, thanks, Masood. So let me move on to Nokia. Nancy, can you tell us a little bit about Nokia's uh, TPA program? Do we have Nancy there? Hi, well, sorry, oh, I had two, okay. two mute buttons. Um, hi, my name is Nancy Lee. I'm with Nokia, I am the lead for our standards work in the WinForum and CBRS Alliance. And I've worked very closely with our team that developed Nokia's CPI training program. I think I might have misheard something from, from uh, Masood, but um, Nokia was by far the earliest to be approved as a TPA. We were the original company. Um, we were an original company involved in CBRS standardization and have a very deep understanding of the CBRS band, all of the standards associated, and we also have extensive experience with training. Um, we do training programs for our own employees that are field installers um, and also for our customers. So we've put together a, a very thorough program uh, for training CPIs. And um, it's correct that we are part of wave two, which means we're not part of the initial ICDs for, for the SAS um, vendors. But um, this, since there is a requirement that all CPIs be capable of working with all SASs, uh, we're actually in a, a better position as a neutral party to provide you with access to the SAS specific information from all of the SAS vendors. Um, one, one of the earlier questions that was asked was about um, how you, what you need to do if you leave a company. And I just wanted to point out that, that as a CPI, your relationship is with your TPA, not directly with the wind forum. And if you move, you don't necessarily need to inform um, your TPA, but it's basically if any of your contact information changes, you would inform your TPA because you have an ongoing relationship with, with your TPA for the duration of your 
your certification. Um, we have registration link on the, the WinForum website. You can register for in-person training now. Uh, it's held um, as there's demand for the course. And then we will also have a self-paced internet course available starting in a couple of weeks. Um, we also have, we have a lot of flexible options. If you're interested in getting the training but not actually getting the PKI certificates for actually doing installation, we have a reduced cost option to do that. Um, the, the estimated course time is about four and a half hours plus taking the exam. Um, obviously for self-paced, you can, you can vary that. And, um, and once you take the course, you'll have a, a link to be able to take the exam in our training um, platform online. That's, um, that's all about Nokia. Thank you. Great. And uh, Richard, I'm, I'm sorry. Yep. I apologize. Just, uh, just a quick, quick clarification. This is Mr. Wolf sure. again. Uh, absolutely, uh, Nancy is absolutely correct that Nokia was the the first uh, TPA to be uh, certified by by Wind Forum. Uh, I stress the fact that Federated was the first web-based uh, TPA program, CPI training program. So I hope that uh, clarifies my my position. Thank you. Right. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Masood. All right, um, Google is our next TPA. Uh, Beatrice Sebastian is their representative. Beatrice, can you tell us a little bit about Google's program? Hi, hello, Richard, and all of my uh, colleague TPAs and uh, all the attendees to this webinar. Thank you, Richard, for going into detail on the responsibilities of the CPI. I feel that, you know, that was a mini training, a mini CPI training already. <laughs> Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Google CPI certification package. It includes five components. Uh, the first one is the online training course that has two and a half hours of video content plus reading material and quizzes to help the candidate prepare for the certification exam. Uh, the content has been developed by members of the Google SAS team who have participated in the definition of the CBRS standards. And we've, uh, we wanted to focus the content on explaining the responsibilities of the CPI and how to do the CPI job, going into practical details on how to determine installation parameters and send them to the SAS. This uh, format has, uh, has proved to be uh, you know, pretty successful. 100% of uh, our CPIs have passed the exam. And uh, the course is hosted on Coursera, which is a training platform that is very well known for is pedagogic tools, accessibility, we have things like subtitles and transcripts, and um, it has a very, um, you know, very convenient bite-sized approach to learning. The course is also available on desktop and mobile devices. The second component is an online certification exam with live proctoring, so you have someone, you know, um, they're, you know, uh, making sure that everything goes well, and this is available 24 by 7. So basically, you can become a CPI in half a day, um, taking the training and the exam. Uh, the third component is a CPI certificate. Fourth, uh, registration in the WinForum database. And the last one is free access to course updates and support during the five-year duration of the certification. The CPI package can be purchased on Coursera for $599, and you can find it by searching on Google for three uh, keywords, Google CBRS CPI. And we also have uh, another a companion training course for installers and network management staff who work with CPIs. That one is just a training, uh, obviously it doesn't need the certification, and this is offered at $399 on Coursera as well. Great. So that's Google. And our, our last, but certainly not least, uh, TPA is uh, Comscope. Uh, Laura Fontaine is here to explain Comscope's program. Laura? Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Richard mentioned, Comscope is a WinForm approved TPA. We host a number of certification courses for installation of our products, and we're, we're very excited to now offer the CPI certification course. Um, we are currently open for business and have certified a number of CPIs already. 
Um, the training is a self-paced online course. It covers the entire CBR, CBRS ecosystem. It also provides lots of practical advice on gathering accurate installation data. So we try to include a lot of information from, that we gathered from our field engineers that do all kinds of surveys and measurements as well as installations. Um, the course also walks installers through the steps to enter the data into the Comscope SAS. So you can see what the actual SAS screens will look like as you go through that workflow. Um, we leave CPIs with a reference guide that they can take with them after the course is over. There's a lot of information and we certainly don't expect everyone to remember every bit of it. Um, our course takes up to four hours to complete, but can be completed in as little as two hours, depending on the installer's level of familiarity with CBRS. And after completing the course portion, students then have one and a half hours to take an exam. But we have found that most are finishing well before then. Um, the exam is video proctored, so there will be someone watching you through, the, through your computer as you take the exam. Uh, the proctors are there to not just monitor the exam, but they're also there to help with any technical issues along the way. And so far, everyone has passed the course with flying colors. Um, and then the final step in the process is getting the digital certificate. And so our certificate authority partner um, would send an, out an email with instructions on how to download the certificate into the key store of your device or your devices. So that can either be a phone, a laptop, um, or a tablet. Um, and then a separate text is sent at the same time with a password to make sure, um, so make sure that you provide your mobile number when you register for the courses. Um, and then you have two weeks to download the certificate package on your device. Um, we have received a lot of questions about storing the certificate and how the information gets into the, into the SAS, especially for the single step registration process. All this is covered in the course and we can also help with any questions um, around these topics. So really our goal is twofold. We really wanna make sure that our CPIs have all the information they need to be successful, but also to make sure the overall process is as seamless and straightforward as possible for them. And if any issues come up, and we know they will, um, we have a dedicated and seasoned customer service team supporting this course as well as our other courses. Um, they have all gone through the training and, and um, so they're, they're very familiar with it all. Um, they're available to help you with, with the process, with any questions that you have. Um, we have currently, we recently worked closely with a company trying to better understand how the certification would work for their particular situation. And so we had, on a, you know, had a number of conversations with them and were able to help them walk, walk them through it. And so um, we understand this is really new and this process doesn't really, it, it works differently for different, different folks and different companies. And so if any questions come up, we are here to work with you. So we really want our CPIs to see this as a partner supporting them throughout the five-year certification period. Um, so you can access our CPI training course on the Comscope website, as well as the WinForum website, as Richard mentioned. And our pricing is on our site, along with a guide to help you get started. So thank you again for joining us today. Great. So uh, let me mention again that there are currently four TPA qualified and accredited organizations, Federated, Nokia, Google, and Comscope. And as uh, Laura just said, you can find the information, all of the information on how to link to them on the uh, WinForum website. Um, and at any given time, if you want information, contact them directly. Uh, WinForum, again, is the accrediting body for the TPAs, but the relationship with the CPI belongs to these individuals or these organizations. Um, so I wanted to comment a little bit about timing. So uh, we have the next phase of, of CBRS, um, hopefully coming up in the next couple of months. It's called ICD or Initial Commercial Deployment. Initial Commercial Deployment will be the first time where CPIs are actually used. At the moment, uh, there are some deployments taking place to test uh, the CBRS system, but those are all done under experimental licenses or in laboratory conditions. In once ICD um, begins, and that is done by public notice from the FCC following the lab certification of our SASs, um, that's when the first commercial deployments in CBRS will occur. I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you the specific date, but we certainly expect it within this year. And at that point, um, the CPIs that are being trained right now by these TPAs will be able to do their job. Um, and begin performing installations and registrations. Some may do some pre-registration information even before ICD, but the radios themselves can't operate with the SASs. So uh, just a little, a few facts. Um, there are 75 CPIs already registered through these programs, and these programs really just began uh, operating recently. So you can see there's an urgency and a demand 
for CPIs. Um, let me ask the group as a whole, tell us a little bit about who you're gonna train. Are you gonna train everybody or do you have specific groups you're training for? Anyone can answer. Tell me a little bit about who you train. Hi, this Let's... is Nancy mm -hmm. um, for for Nokia. We we have customers of all different types, so so we can okay. handle training for um, for any types of deployments, whether it's for existing mobile operators or for fixed wireless um, or uh, for enterprises. Great. It's the, it's the same for com, for Comscope as well. We would um, we welcome any type of company or individual to come take our training. Yeah. So, uh, so um, uh, Richard Federated. Uh, so first of all, the, uh, we don't really require a high level of prerequisite for our program. Uh, our program includes uh, several modules that we are going to go through some uh, detailed aspect of CBRS. So, uh, and of course, uh, I just wanted to mention before that we have also a companion training for uh, basics of the CBRS that uh, we are launching. Uh, so uh, the prerequisite is is kind of very shallow, and as far as far as the um, individuals and organizations, of course, uh, uh, we can we can go through a kind of a big spectrum of individuals coming to become the CPI as well as big organization, and we are already uh, working with some big MNOs and some of the big MSOs that. Uh, uh, I can I can tell you that uh, a little more than half of those that are already uh, CPI trained are done by us. Uh, we are also the same with uh, big MNOs and uh, also OEMs. So OEMs, MNOs, and MSOs are the ones that uh, create the most number of CPIs we have already trained. Thank you. All right. So hi, um, um, yeah, and, sorry. Um, Hi. Yeah, for Google, same same thing for Google. Our, you know, we want our training and and package to be accessible to everyone, particularly, you know, knowing that the CPI is held by the individual. But um, at the same time, we've been working with, um, you know, mobile operators, uh, OEMs, and WISPs to, uh, you know, to make sure that our program fits their needs. So yeah, everyone is welcome. Great. And so what I'm hearing from the four of you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you will, you will basically train anyone who comes in the door for you. Um, and the prerequisites, it would be a good idea if you have some RF experience, uh, so you understand some basic radio background, but these are not PhD courses, right? It's a, it's a course which is training the specific operational parameters that a CPI needs to follow. Um, some background on the CBRS ecosystem, an understanding of the roles and responsibilities of TPAs, CAs, CPIs, and SASs, and, and the equipment providers and operators, uh, that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's restrictive in the sense that I don't think perhaps you should just walk in off the street and take CPI training, but if you have some background in RF, you'd also don't have to have a degree in RF to, uh, to approach this. Is that correct? It's, it's sort of an open platform. Anyone that is correct for us. Yeah. Good. So um, the next phase with this is that after ICD happens, and ICD can operate uh, a minimum of 30 days, uh, though uh, with government approvals and reports and all the autocratic and bureaucratic stuff that has to happen at the FCC and, and government level may go on for a period of time after that, but we expect it as soon as possible thereafter that a full commercial deployment will take place in the ecosystem. Full commercial deployment initially will just be GAA because the uh, PAL auction parameters have not yet been set forth by the FCC. They will be forthcoming by the FCC, but the initial commercial deployment will be followed by general commercial deployment of GAA. Um, that will also include the ESCs, uh, for those of you who operate on co in coastal areas, that will be of critical importance to you because the ESCs protect federal incumbents. Um, and so the whole ecosystem basically comes online. The ESCs will be online as well, uh, hopefully during ICD. 
and um, once commercialization happens, the demands for CPIs are expected to go through the roof because all of those different uses that the TPAs mentioned, whether they're MSOs, which would be the um, cellular and mobile providers, or MNOs, um, uh, excuse me, the MNOs are the cellular providers and MSOs are cable providers uh, or WISPs or fixed operators or specialized vertical uses such as um, um, IoT or uh, specified vertical uses such as security and surveillance or any other vertical. All of them are likely to come online at the same time. Now, not everyone will enter the ecosphere in, in the same rate, but there are quite a few that will be transitioning from an older standard, three, uh, part 90, will transition over into part 96 over about a nine month period of time in uh, when their licenses sunset next year. Um, so we expect a lot of traffic to begin, especially with experimenting on the band and seeing how it works for each particular use. Um, are you ready to take on a lot of CPIs? Are there things that, that you want people to know about um, accessing your program that will be efficient for all of those kinds of uses? Uh, make that the last question and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Anything else you want to say about your programs, any of you? Nancy? Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, we have capacity to, to um, do large-scale training, so we can even arrange for, for on-demand um, live training if that's something that, that um, somebody has a large group of, of CPIs they want trained at once. Great. Masood? Uh, yes, uh, same, same to us, uh, of course, and uh, we, have a, we have a kind of a large team that uh, or taking phone call, taking emails, and uh, we can uh, we can kind of go through the the, the full support. And uh, uh, again, we, specifically, uh, we have a CPI operation team as well as field engineers to uh, to help CPIs to be able to understand and learn, uh, collect data, and uh, so. Uh, and we don't have limitation in terms of the number of CPIs that uh, we can train and and work with uh, both through operation as well as uh, field testing and uh, learning process. Thank you. Great. Bea, anything with Google? Hi. Um, yes, any, so our, uh, our online training is pretty comprehensive and accessible and, you know, we, we found that is the easiest way to, to get CPI certification. However, anyone who may have other, um, other needs, uh, happy to, uh, to answer questions and, and figure out a way to, to help them get through certification if they email cpi-training at google.com. Excellent. And Laura for Comscope. Yes, so so our course is available, you know, online, so uh, it's round the clock availability. We have people, um, a customer service group in place, as we have for many years, um, available to take calls and um, handle any specific unique situations anybody would have, any questions. So, um, and any any um, number of CPIs we are available to um, and uh, equipped to handle. Excellent, Lee, if you'd go to the next slide, please. So um, at the top of the hour, I provided my contact information. Here it is again, if you have any questions. I wanna thank our panel, uh, Masood Olfat from Federated, Nancy Lee from Nokia, Beatrice Sebastian from Google, and Laura Fontaine from Comscope. Um, they've all done an excellent job of working very, very hard to put together a program that works for the ecosystem and for all of your needs. Um, at this point, I'd like to take some questions. Uh, I'd like to leave the panel on, yeah. so if they are the right people to take. Uh, Lee, did we have any questions for the all, audience? We actually have a lot of questions, so I've kind of queued okay. them up and organized them a bit here on my desktop. Um, the first one I was going to start with is, are there any organizations providing liability insurance for CPIs? Uh, this is a common question that I hear about um, insurance. Since the CPIs are independent contractors, uh, most likely they're going to use business insurance that would be the, the effectively the same as an independent contractor uh, insurance for organizations that are operating um, and employing CPIs. Um, it would probably fall under the umbrella of their operating insurance, but um, the answer is there's no specific category for CPIs, but there are for operating installers in the field and uh, would request that you contact your um, insurance agent to get some more specific information about that. 
it'd typically be uh, uh, professional errors and admissions insurance, wouldn't it? Yeah, it could include that um, because they are uh, providing data that if they make a mistake, there could be some liability. Um, if they're working in conjunction with or are going to be a physical installer, there may be some in the field type of insurance that's required. Depends upon how you're going to deploy them. So the next question is, is there any inspector randomly checking uh, CBSDs installed by CPIs to verify that they've installed correctly, that they've been installed correctly and the information reported to the SAS is correct? It's an excellent question. Um, the answer is, is that the system somewhat um, uh, addresses itself. Um, as with, I don't know if any of you are, have ever built a house or, or done something in a neighborhood or seen something in a neighborhood where there's a code condition and it's incorrect, very often what will happen is, is there'll be a place that you can call, in this case it'll be the TPAs or the SASAs, um, to indicate that there's a problem. Um, if an incumbent calls and says there's interference on the channel, um, there can be an investigation that takes place. Um, the direct answer to the question is, is we do not, um, the, the, WinForum uh, does not have the relationship with the CPI, CPI, so it would be up to the TPAs if they wanted to do that. There is no program for checking or inspecting CBSDs. However, as I said, complaints will drive a lot of what happens in the CBSD, CBRS ecosystem. Do any of our TPAs have any follow-on yeah. on that? I don't, I don't know yeah, that I can, any more on that. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, add, yeah, I can add. Thank you, uh, Masood from Federated. So uh, uh, and of course that that requires some aspect from the from the SAS. Uh, uh, the the issue is that uh, there is a process for the incumbents to report the uh, interference, and the SASs are defining uh, like a, a procedure for following on to isolate and find out the uh, the entity that is causing uh, extra interference. Um, so uh, SASs have different ways to handle that, uh, either through measurement, field testing. Uh, the, the entities in the field are mandated to report measurement to the SAS, uh, so SAS can, can collect them. And uh, obviously, at the end of the day, uh, those entities, CPIs, uh, and the people who are registering and putting information in the SAS are legally responsible for the accuracy of them. And uh, uh, SAS, again, through measurement and uh, through report from the incumbents, can identify whether those informations are correct or not. And let me also say that this is not all on the CPIs. The, um, the FCC Enforcement Bureau is still around, and if an operator moves the device or does something that's not correct, even if it has nothing to do with what the CPI has done, um, there may be a process for discipline with respect to that equipment as well. So there are a couple of checks and balances uh, for the system. Uh, other questions? Uh, next question is, what happens if a CPI certifies an installation, but later a bad actor or vandal changes a CVSD's physical deployment? Uh, how does the law handle these possibilities? Right. So um, that's a very good question and one that uh, comes up quite frequently. So if the CPI has actually done their job correctly and the information has been entered accurately, that's the end of their responsibility with regards to that CBSD. So if a, an operator or a bad actor, as this question person um, asked, uh, does something that is against the rules, those people are responsible for their own activities. And that's where the FCC enforcement or potentially even criminal court system, if there's something that they're doing which is uh, intentional, um, could get involved. The, um, the CPI is responsible for what they do when they do it to be accurate and correct. Um, if the operator wants to move the device to another location, they may need to bring in a CPI to do that again. Operators and CPI and TPAs are responsible to follow Part 96 consistently. So if there is a, a, a problem, um, it'll be addressed at the level of the problem. If the problem is with the CBSD being moved by someone other than the CPI, um, then that would also be addressed by the appropriate forum. Other questions? Next question. Uh, are the CPI question pools publicly posted? No. <laughs> because this is a certification program and because this program is um, directly related to some sensitive incumbents, 
Um, we do not uh, place the questions out there for memorization. You actually do need to go through the course, learn the material, and pass the exam. I know a lot of people compare this to like the HAM exam, uh, the amateur radio um, exams where they have books of questions. Um, the, ex the exam questions are keyed into the specifications and the, the curriculum requirements that each of the TPAs are following. Um, if you follow their curriculum, you can answer the questions. And so, no, we don't publicly post the questions. Next so question. Uh, one question I got multiple copies of, um, how do you find a list of CPIs? Well, um, that's a good question. So uh, CPIs are independent contractors or they work for individual employers. So just like any business party, they've got to go out and market themselves for their services. I don't believe we make the CPI, you correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, because I don't remember. The, the CPI database is not publicly available, is it? So the, so the full CPI database is not publicly available. There is a public list of the CPI IDs along with their status and their uh, public key information uh, that is published and that's what the SAS is, uh, use and that, that gets updated daily and that's what the SAS is use uh, to confirm that a, uh, as part of the process to confirm that a CPI is in fact um, act, an active CPI. But uh, for yeah. privacy reasons, we don't post names, addresses, anything like that. Right. It uh, might be something that any of you TPAs might want to do something with. Yeah, you. the TPAs um, may post it as a part of their, but that would be the, with as a part of their uh, legal agreement with their CPIs. I don't know. Do any of the TPAs uh, yeah, want to so, comment? Yeah. So that's that's exactly what I wanted to say. That uh, we are uh, because uh, we are also a SaaS administrator, and uh, through our uh, kind of connection with the with the users, uh, we can uh, recommend. The, TP, the CPIs that have been trained by us, we can recommend and promote them among the users. So, uh, and that's individual and uh, basically it's not the responsibility for the WIN forum or through the uh, official WIN forum CPI database. It's individually uh, on our own site uh, as a SAS as well as a TPA vendor. So what I would suggest the best approach if you're looking for a CPI is either contact one of the TPAs um, or uh, reach out on the internet to advertising CPIs that are looking to do business in your region. Other questions? Yeah, give me a second. I'm scrolling through them and... Glad we have a lot of questions. It's nice. <laughs> uh... Will the information provided to the SAS take the place of registering with the FCC or will the data that has been registered with, or does the data have to be registered with both the FCC and the SAS? Um, so I'm not sure what that refers to. So each piece of equipment has to get its own FCC ID and, and, and be verified as valid for um, at least its type um, within uh, the FCC and, uh, and go through FCC testing of the CBSDs. But registration information is not registered with the FCC, it's registered with the SAS. Um, and so the object of the registration information is to provide the SAS group, the group of SAS administrators, with information so that they can coordinate um, the allocation of spectrum and uh, the amount of power that can be used um, and protect the incumbents accordingly. Um, there is no crossover between those things. Uh, devices need to be appropriate for use on the ecosystem. They need to be certified with the FCC as devices that can be used on the ecosystem. Then the CPIs do their installation. And the SASs are already approved or will be at that point approved by the FCC, so there's no crossover of that. With regard to CPI's work, it is substantially um, in accordance with, um, with their rules. I don't know if anybody else has comment on that. But you're all SASs, so uh, you can you can uh, provide additional insight. Nope. Okay. Other questions? So I had multiple questions requesting that I show this page on the screen. So I'm showing this ah. page on the screen. Um, uh, I think we'll do this as the last question. 
Um, has the FCC hinted at what the CBRS enforcement regime will look like? Will commissions uh, enforcement bureau have resources dedicated to CBRS enforcement? So um, before I answer that rather provocative question, let me just explain what you're showing on the screen here. This is the uh, Win Forums uh, CPI page um, under, and if you scroll down uh, from there, you will see the approved TPAs um, listed. I believe they're hot linked there, so you can click on one of those and it'll take you to their website. Um, this is easily achieved by going for the public um, site for WinForum, clicking on CBRS and going to approved vendors. That will also show you the CAs and others. Uh, Lee is showing you an example of Comscope. He clicked on the Comscope um, uh, a logo and up comes the CPI training program for CBRS. Each of the TPAs have a similar uh, link. Um, and if you uh, click on those, it'll take you there. Now, as for that question, um, so enforcement by the FCC is a regulatory matter and it is completely within the purview of the FCC to enforce violations of its rules. Um, and they have never really seriously clarified um, you know, when or how they will enforce rules. Um, historically, if there is a problem in the uh, band, um, it is addressed by investigation and uh, review. And if there is a problem that's identified and they go ahead and decide that it's serious enough, they can bring an action against a particular individual or particular company for violations of their rules. Um, uh, you know, it's not really Win Forum's place to say how enforcements will take place. But with regards to CPI, since the subject today is CPI, there is a very specified um, direction of investigating issues with CPIs or with data that comes into the SAS as a result of the registration process. Um, if that is a violative of Part 96 or the specifications, there is a scrutiny and review process that is to undertaken to find out if it was an innocent error or something intentional and the scope of which is then followed up by the appropriate agencies from uh, the TPAs all the way to the courts, depending upon what might be necessary. Um, there will be an enforcement process, so if the question is how do I get around this, um, I warn you that getting trying to get around FCC regulations is never a good idea. <laughs> um, so. That's our presentation for today. I'm sure we could go on for a lot more. And if you have other questions, please feel free to send them in to us. As Lee said, there's a copy of these slides and this presentation will be available on the Win Forum. I'd like to thank our guests, Masood Olfat of Federated, Nancy Lee of Nokia, Beatrice Sebastian of Google, and Laura Fontaine of Comscope. I wanna thank uh, Stephanie Hamill and Lee Pucker for being our staff today. Uh, my name is Richard Bernhardt and I'm the, um, the National Spectrum Advisor for WISPA. We hope you've gotten some good information out of this presentation and please join us for our future webinars on all subjects having to do with the WIND Forum and CBRS. Have a wonderful day and come back again.